You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC. Nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell securities or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of the ways the message is spread. OIC also offers a variety of other resources to those interested in learning more about options, including webinars, podcasts, and live events. For more information, check out www.optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, OIC's Director of Retail Education, Ed Modla. It's time to break down the latest option strategies. That means it's time for Strategy Spotlight. On today's Strategy Spotlight, I am pleased to have with me Mark Benzaquin, who currently manages the OCC Investor Services team. Uh, this is a team of professionals who provide a vast array of services to the industry, supporting all products cleared by OCC, but also heavily involved in the educational efforts of OIC. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Mark here with us today to talk about a particular strategy. First of all, Mark, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, talk a little bit about your background in the business and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, certainly, Ed, and uh, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Uh, my background, well, I started in the business back in 1997 at the CBOE clerking for a market-making firm. Uh, I was there for about two years before moving to the San Francisco Exchange. Uh, at the time, was known as the Peacoast Exchange back in 99 to begin trading. Uh, the interesting thing with that period is that was a time when most of the stocks and the options that traded along with them were singly listed, meaning if you wanted, for example, to trade IBM, you had to do it in Chicago. If you wanted to trade Dell, that was in Philadelphia. Uh, the San Francisco Exchange had most of the dot-com companies, and that was late 90s, so that was the height of the dot-com boom. Long story short, I went out there. Everything became duly listed, meaning you could trade any option pretty much on any exchange. Um, so a lot of the traders began to uh, you know, move from the San, Fran San Francisco exchange. And most of the people that I knew were from Chicago. So I figured it might be uh, better to get back to Chicago before they did because they certainly had more experience than I. And so I came back to Chicago in 2000, got a job on the brokerage side, and I spent the next uh, 15 and a half years or so filling orders in the NASDAQ and the Russell trading pits. Uh, around 2015, summer 2015, I was looking for a change. 
And because I always had an interest in teaching and certainly a background in finance, I was lucky enough to find a position with OCC on their investor services team. And recently, I became a manager of that team of, as you had mentioned, options professionals. And uh, things are going along wonderfully. Well, that's, that's great to hear. It's certainly a diverse career, not just in the in the roles you've had in the industry, but where you've been. So you've got certainly a lot of uh, expertise to offer us here today. Now, I know you wanted to talk about the options collar. So why don't we first just start at the ground floor of uh, why you chose the collar and, and what type of market outlook or condition could lead an investor to consider this strategy? Yeah, certainly. For me, options are wonderful in that they offer us a variety of possibilities. Options give us options. One of those possibilities is a means of protection, uh, that options can actually be used to offset risk rather than be risky in and of themselves. So a collar is a protection strategy for investors looking to protect their downside on their stock or their portfolio in times of uncertainty. So whether it be protection from a certain market event like upcoming earnings or drug trial results or just as general protection from uh, market uncertainty and volatility, many investors can choose the collar as their protection vehicle. And really, let's face it, with the current socioeconomic and political climate in our country where a single tweet can send the market into a tailspin, protection against the various what-ifs might not be a bad idea. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. On the long list of reasons to use options, Uh, risk management doesn't get quite enough attention as it should. One of the things we like to do here at OIC is uh, make sure we communicate that message. So that's, that's a great description. Now we know what type of investor we're looking at. Let's get into the strategy of the collar, the pieces, and how it's put together. Can you describe for our listeners exactly what the collar is? Yeah, certainly. So I like to look at a collar as a tale of two trades, and we can think of it as constructing a building. The foundation of the building or the foundation of the collar, as it were, is going to be our long put. Typically, an out-of-the-money put is used, and that's going to act as our floor. Now, what's uh, integral here is that the strike that we choose, the strike of that long put, dictates the share price at which we've got the right to sell our long stock. But that protection, obviously, is going to come as a cost as we need to pay for that long put. So one of my favorite analogies, and certainly something uh, I'm sure that the listeners are familiar with, is that uh, long puts, or in this case a protective put, it's similar to an insurance policy. So we've got insurance protecting many of the important things in our house, right? Our homes, uh, our cars, our health. So why not our wealth or our retirement? When it comes to the long collar, that asset we're looking to protect is our portfolio or a specific stock. So the difference between the stock price and the strike price, that's going to be our deductible. For example, if we've got a $10,000 car and a $500 deductible, the payout in the case of an accident is 9500 If we own stock at, say, $100 and we buy a 95 strike put, that's going to give us the right to sell those shares at $95 if necessary. So really, it's the same concept, right? Sticking with that insurance analogy, we pay for the protection on our car with monthly or annual premiums. For options, it's the premium that we pay when we enact the trade. So here's where I look at things as kind of a a glass half full. What I like to say is that when it comes to protection, if at the end of that life cycle of the option, the protection isn't needed, the contract simply expires worthless and you move on. The funny thing is, you know, I've talked to many investors that often feel slighted because they paid for something that wasn't needed, but then I always remind them when it comes to your car, were you upset that you didn't crash your car last month? Well, of course not. The whole idea is that you don't want that protection, or I should say that you don't need the protection, but that doesn't mean that your money's been wasted because getting in a car accident isn't obviously the ideal outcome when it comes to driving. Just as with that protective put, the ideal outcome isn't that you use the protection when it kicks in. The ideal outcome is that the stock continues to appreciate in value. Now, the second part of the trade, that's the ceiling. So uh, just as the long put acts as the floor of our building, but to pay for it, we 
offset that cost by selling a short call. Uh, because we're long stock now with that short call, some of your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with the covered call strategy. So just as that put limited our downside, that short call is going to limit our upside, or it puts a cap or a ceiling on our trade. So once again, strike selection is important. We're not just looking to collect enough premium to cover the cost of the put, or as close to it as we can, the strike of that short call, that's going to determine our obligation to sell those shares should we get assigned. Investors typically are going to choose uh, an out-of-the-money call to sell as they might be averse to selling their stock if called to do so. But if they go too far out of the money, that's going to result in lower premiums, which is going to result in more money out of pocket for the strategy as a whole. So really, just like with all options trading, uh, the options collar, it's going to be a delicate balance between risk and reward. Oh, well, that's certainly a great description. And I like your analogies there with insurance, especially the numbers that puts it into context. So we have insurance to the downside. We protected our share position. We're paying for that insurance. Uh, we're selling a call to the upside, so mitigating that cost. Now, what about this this concept you've alluded to about whether or not you can do this at zero cost or you go out of pocket? If an investor is pricing up uh, the stock versus the put and call, how likely is it they can do zero cost? And, and what is that dynamic? What do they have to give up or gain in order to get zero cost or to uh, have to go out of pocket? Well, as I mentioned, right, it's a, a delicate balance between risk and reward. So let's look at that example again. We've got a $100 stock. If we buy a 95 strike put, let's say that put cost us $2. So to pay for that, we would look for an offsetting call, an out-of-the-money call, where we can collect roughly $2. Now, the likelihood of finding that call is going to depend on you know many factors of the stock, uh, how long we're going out or volatility, for example. Uh, certainly, the the price of an option is is a pure function of supply and demand. But let's say we find a out of the money call that has a two dollar value to it that affords us that zero dollar collar or that zero cost collar. The problem is, is maybe that out-of-the-money call isn't as far out of the money as we would like. Maybe that out-of-the-money call is only a 101 strike or a 102 strike. And what the problem with that is, is that it's going to reduce our upside profit potential, and it's going to possibly increase the likelihood of those shares getting called away. If we sold, say, a 105 call, against our uh, against our collar the likelihood of those shares getting called away at 105 is certainly going to be significantly less than those shares being called at 101 the trade off is the premium that we receive for that 105 strike is going to be often significantly less than the premium we we would we would receive from the 101 strike and i know I'm throwing a lot of numbers around here, so you know I hope I'm not confusing things, but the point being is that the further out of the money we go, the less premium that we're going to collect, and keep in mind that premium we're looking to offset the cost of that protection. Yeah, I think the numbers certainly help, and the way you describe it, things are starting to get very interesting with this strategy. If you want to execute this at, at zero cost, as you said, you may have to go lower in strike price for your call, which doesn't give you as much upside potential and may get your shares called away sooner as you describe it. You're sort of balancing between two things. You're giving up something to get something. Now, options offer flexibility. There's a unique twist that you can put on many different option strategies. So with respect to the collar, what types of, of different variations might there be of the collar strategy? We have the long stock, long put, and short call. What other things might an investor um, need to be aware of or consider for different market conditions? Well, like I mentioned earlier, and I know it's a horrible pun, but it's something that we use often, is that options give us options. So when you kind of break things down into the simplest terms, there's four basic trades. We can buy a call, sell a call, buy a put, or sell a put, and that's it. Uh, 
But because of the flexibility that you had mentioned, uh, we can put several options together in various ways to help us accomplish any number of goals. So as you had just mentioned, the typical collar is long stock, long put, short call. And the key here being that long put, right, because that's going to be our protection. In fact, it's so important because that long put affords us protection all the way down to zero, meaning that in the, exi- the uh, original example we looked at, $100 stock, $95 put, we've got the right to sell those shares at $95 regardless of where they go. They can go down to zero and we're protected. But really, what's the likelihood that that's going to happen, meaning what's the likelihood those shares are going to go to zero? So, for example, if we're looking at uh, an ETF, possibly, that tracks one of the more popular broad-based indices, it's trading around $290 a share. So it's not out of the question that maybe shares are going to drop 10 or 20% sometime in the future, but 100%, well, that's probably a pretty big pill for uh, the listeners to swallow, right? So that being said, do we really need all of that protection down to zero? And this is where things get interesting. This is where those variations come in that you were talking about. What we can do is we could sell another put against that collar. And and it's a strategy that we call a put spread collar. It's similar to your traditional collar in that you're long the -the out-of-the-money put, short the -the out-of-the-money call, and you're long shares, obviously. But as that out-of-the-money put offers us protection all the way down to zero – And based on our forecast, maybe we don't think shares are absolutely going to crash. So we can sell a further out of the money put against that position. And because we're selling more, right, every time we sell, we're collecting more premium. The risk, obviously, is that we no longer have that protection down to zero, and we're only protected between our put strikes. So, again, let's look at it from a number standpoint. Let's say we're long stock at 100. We're nervous about upcoming earnings, you know, another reason why people, you know, might put a protection play uh, into place. So if things go south, maybe we think that there's going to be a 10% drop in stock price. So we're going to buy a 90-strike put, and maybe let's say that put costs us $2, as we had looked at earlier. So that gives us the right to sell our shares at $90. Now, to pay for that protection, we're going to sell a 110-strike, and that's going to generate about a dollar and a half of premium for us. So the $90 put gives us protection from 90 and below. The $110 call that we sold, that is going to obligate us to sell shares at 110 if stock rallies. So not including transaction, uh, transaction costs, the protection now costs us about $50 out of pocket versus the original 200 right? We paid $2 for the option uh, for the put. We sold the call at a dollar and a half. That's a 50-cent debit. And because options typically um, – typically represent a controlling interest in 100 shares of stock. We've got 50 cents times 100 or $50 in the real world. So our collar is going to cost us $50. If we had just had that put by itself, that would have cost us 200 So let's put the twist on now with that put spread. Uh, the put spread collar, since we're only expecting a 10% sell-off, uh, maybe we don't need that protection all the way down to zero. Maybe we're comfortable with that risk that even if shares drop, they're not going to drop by more than 10% or, you know, certainly not uh, by more than a substantial amount. So if that's our feeling and we're confident in that feeling or that forecast, we might sell a further out of the money put, say the 85 strike, and maybe that's going to generate us a credit of a dollar. So now the net cost of that strategy, as opposed to paying $50 for the strategy, now we're being paid $50. Now we've got a net credit of $50. The catch, obviously, is that the protection that we have is only going to be between our put strikes. So we're only protected if shares drop below $90 up until 85 Anything below that, we're, we lose that protection. So... With that put spread collar, we're giving up plenty of that downside protection. So the investor has to be sure of the accuracy and they have to be confident in their forecast before they can get into a trade like this. But the put spread collar, definitely one of my favorite variations on the trade. And there would certainly seem to be a time and a place for this. As I heard you describe that, I'm thinking that we are 
uh, purchasing less insurance and paying less for it. Now we've got four pieces instead of three. So as we're trying to make sure we get this right, we had the long stock, long put, short call. The fourth piece with the put spread collar is a short put further out of the money. That gives us less protection and less cost. That's really well laid out. So you had the traditional collar, I've got a put spread collar. And before I let you go, are there are there other things that investors should be aware of as they're constructing or thinking about collars, uh, maybe with strikes and expirations, different things they can do with regard to uh, those variations? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, remember, again, my bad pun from earlier, options give us options. So uh, another variation of the collar is maybe the investor is looking at long-term protection as opposed to just protection uh, in the next 30 or 45 or 60 days for an upcoming market event. Maybe they're looking for overall protection on their portfolio, so they're looking for longer term. Maybe they're looking at buying protection for the next nine months or 12 months or even two years. So if they're looking at buying longer-term puts, they can also sell longer-term calls. The problem with selling long calls is uh, longer-term calls, I should say, is even though it generates uh, higher premiums for us, one of the things option sellers is always looking for is for that option to expire worthless so they can keep all that premium for themselves. Well, if you're selling an option, uh, a short call, possibly a year and a half down the road, there's a lot of time for things to happen. Uh, and part of uh, an option's value, something that your listeners might be familiar with, is called time decay or theta. And theta really works to advantage for option sellers in the short term. So uh, a variation that we can talk about is something that we could call or something that we call a staggered collar. And basically what that is is we've got longer-term puts for that longer-term protection, but we sell shorter-term calls against it. And the reason we do so is a couple things. Number one, theta, remember that time decay is working in our favor. That value of that option is going to go to zero quicker in the next 30 to 45 days than if that option was sold for a year and a half or so down the road. So maybe we look at selling a 45-day call to really take advantage of that time decay. It also is going to allow us to be more targeted uh, with our short call in terms of our obligation to sell over the next, you know, say, year and a half of our uh, strategy as a whole. And what I mean by that is, as the stock moves, we can better adjust that position and manage our risk. So if we, again, our scenario, we've got a 100 strike call, uh, I'm sorry, a $100 uh, stock, maybe we've got a 90 or 95 strike put for the protection, and let's say we sell a 105 call against it. Well, maybe in the next uh, 30 to 45 days, the stock moves up to 104. Well, we can always close out that short 105 call that we have, uh, buy it back to close and sell maybe a 107 call another 30 to 45 days down the road or a 108 call. The point being is we can uh, adjust the option according to our forecast at that point in time. If we sell the call a year and a half out, obviously, you know, we're never locked into the trade. We can still buy it back and, and manage the position that way. But it's much easier, I feel, to manage the position over the short term than the long. Now, here's the catch. Here's the maybe not so obvious risk is that if we get assigned on that short call, regardless if it's, uh, you know, 30 days out or 180 days out or, you know, 18 months out, by selling an option, we are obligated uh, for assignment, meaning that if somebody calls that stock away from us, we don't have a choice but to, but to sell shares. The not so obvious risk that I was alluding to is if our shares do get called away, we're giving up all of that time premium uh, had we sold those longer dated calls because we sold the shorter dated. And the, what I mean by that is a 105 call expiring, say, 45 days out might be worth $2 versus that same call expiring a year and a half down the road might be trading for $10. So if we get assigned in the next 30 to 45 days, we're giving up all of that extra time premium 
that we had uh, foregone by selling the shorter dated option. So certainly that staggered expiry, it's just like any other strategy, it's got its benefits and it certainly has its risks as well. There's also something that we call a laddered collar where we're sit with it kind of uh, is a combination of the two. We've got uh, long-term protection, but we've got shorter term calls as well as long term calls. Again, let's say we're long a hundred stock, uh, long a hundred shares of stock. Actually, let me backtrack on that for a second. Let's use an easier example. Stocks trading a hundred and we're long five hundred shares. So protection, we buy five, maybe we buy five of the six month eighty five strike puts. Right, some you know, somewhat long term protection. But rather than selling five calls against it in one lump sum, maybe we sell a thirty day one oh five call, maybe we sell another sixty day one ten strike, a one hundred and twenty day one fifteen call, and then maybe two of the six month calls uh, at the 120 strike. The idea here is that those shorter dated calls give us that rapid time to decay that we're looking for while those longer dated calls generate those higher premiums. So it's kind of a best of both worlds uh, scenario between the shorter dated options and the longer dated protection. Uh, but like that staggered collar we talked about earlier, assignment on some or all of those short calls can certainly turn that entire P&L upside down. So as with any longer term strategy, we've got to actively monitor the position and have a uh, plan in place to manage that position if necessary. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of good stuff there. You've certainly highlighted the flexibility of options. We started with this traditional collar with three pieces and have taken it in several different directions, not just by adding a spread to it, but uh, hearing you speak with that last question, changing expirations, changing stri strike prices. There's an awful lot we can do here. As so commonly is the, is the case with option strategies, there's a lot of versatility in what we can do. So thank you very much for all of that. It was excellent. Thank you for joining me here today. Last thing, Mark, if investors or who are listening in want to get a hold of you or your team and ask some options-related questions, how can they reach out to you? Oh, absolutely, Ed. Thanks for that uh, opportunity. One of the uh, things that we pride ourselves here at the Investor Services Desk is uh, not only our willingness, but you know certainly our enjoyment of speaking with investors uh, on a daily basis. They can contact us via email at options at the OCC com, or we also have a live chat feature on our website where they can simply log in and speak to us directly uh, live and one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, they can reach our website at www.options, uh, that's options with an S, uh, optionseducation.org.org. Well, you guys do tremendous work over there, and I certainly hope our listeners take advantage of you as a resource. Thanks again for joining me here today, Mark, and that is today's Strategy Spotlight. Ready for a little nostalgia? It's time to take a look back. In today's Looking Back, I'm going to go to the beginning of the industry in the 1970s. Of course, 1973 was a big year for the options industry. We had the launch of CBOE, the founding of the Options Clearing Corporation in conjunction with those two gave us listed options. And we also had the publishing of the Black-Scholes formula that gave some structure around the pricing of options. So 1973 was a big year, and I do want to focus a bit on the cautious approach the SEC took with their judgments and rulemaking in the 1970s. When listed options were launched, there were only 16 stocks that traded options. Only call options had been approved at that time. The SEC did not approve put options. They stand for investor protection, and they're aiming to make sure they maintain a fair and orderly marketplace. So they were concerned about how put options might be used to manipulate the market, or that investors simply wouldn't understand put options enough. It took four more years, not until 1977, until the SEC finally approved the listing of put options for trading by the public. When they did so, they also restrict, restricted trading on puts to only five stocks on each of the exchanges. By this time, there were three exchanges, 
After 1973, the industry grew and CBOE was joined by the American Stock Exchange and the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. Three exchanges now traded options and each of them were allowed only five stocks to trade puts. The industry continued to grow rapidly and this set off alarms at the SEC. They're very cautious in their approach. So in 1977, the SEC actually placed a moratorium on the listing of any new options on additional stocks. Effectively, they halted any new stocks from getting options. They did this to give themselves some time to review the industry and make sure that as investors were investing with options, they were doing so in a safe and secure manner. This investigation and review lasted over two years and the moratorium was lifted in 1980. Following the moratorium, the SEC recommended to the exchanges that they implement more strict market surveillance and customer protection methods. From there, the industry continued to expand not only in the number of stocks with listed options, but also crossed into different product groups through the listing of options in indices, debt instruments, and foreign currencies. So the launch of the industry had its bumps through the road, but got through it cleanly and has grown rapidly throughout the last several decades. And that's today's Looking Back. Next, let's upgrade your options toolbox with cutting-edge trading platforms, devices, and information. Let's talk about tools, resources, and good reads. The OCC website has plenty of tools for investors to use, one of which is the OCC New Listings tool. Their website is www.theocc.com, and this can be found under the Market Data section New Listings is a spreadsheet updated daily. It provides a list of stock symbols along with their company name, the date of the new listing, and which exchange is adding options to this symbol. It could be one of two things. This could be new options trading on a brand new exchange that hadn't traded options before, or this could be an additional exchange where options already trade somewhere else. This tool will identify which of, this, which of those two it is. Most commonly, this type of tool will be used after an IPO. A common question from investors after a high-profile IPO is when will options trade? Generally speaking, it will be at least five business days after the IPO, but this tool, new listings on the OCC's website, can help you identify exactly what date the exchanges might list options. Some other uses... If you, trade, uh, if you trade stock or trade, want to trade options on a symbol that has seen increased volume and doesn't currently have options, you can use this tool to identify if the exchanges have decided to list new options. And you can look back if you're interested in knowing when options began to trade in previous years. This tool can be searched for over five years. That's the OCC new listings tool at the OCC's website. A resource many of you may be familiar with is StockTwits at StockTwits.com. This was founded in 2009 as a Twitter-like social media platform specifically tailored for investors and traders. They use the symbol hashtag or the common hashtag approach that Twitter does. They cleverly call this the cash tag, which is a hashtag followed by a stock symbol that will drive you to a particular conversation. The main use is the exchange of ideas, but within those discussions, you can also find timely links to news releases or press reports. This can be particularly useful during, during earnings season if you are having trouble finding a conference call transcript or the specific results of an earnings announcement. You can go to a resource like this, view the discussion, and possibly pick out links. Also, if there's a large move in a stock and you're having trouble determining exactly what is going on or what is driving that move, a message board like this with investors and traders who have vested interests in these symbols can provide you with links and maybe information that might be more obscure and difficult to find. And that's today's resource. For good reads, I've selected Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. 
This was originally published in 1989 as a compilation of 16 interviews with top traders around the world. They are now considered legendary traders. You'll read about their success stories, but more importantly, you'll get a candid description of the lessons they learned along the way. There's certainly a lot of entertainment value here, but also key takeaways that can help you with your trading decision and discipline as you manage your money. That's the Goodreads of Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. And that's today's tools, resources, and Goodreads. We love connecting with our listeners. With that in mind, let's take a moment to answer a few questions on OIC's Wide World of Options Q&A segment. In industry happenings, as usual, we're going to give some feedback to our listeners. We're going to answer your questions. We appreciate all of the feedback that we get, so keep the questions coming. First one comes from Joe and Linda. In a previous episode, Stan Freifeld talked about gamma scalping. Does he sell a put against his long call to create a synthetic position, or are the stock and options positions separate? Well, when gamma scalping, you are holding long options positions constant. That gives you the long gamma. As the underlying moves higher, your deltas will increase. And the idea is to keep bringing your deltas back to neutral. So as the stock rallies, you sell stock to neutralize your delta. And as the stock drops, you buy shares to neutralize your delta. The gamma comes from the options part and the scalping comes from the stock part. So they are separate positions. If you sold a put, you would disrupt both sides of that. The tricky part is knowing when to rehedge. As the stock rallies, at what point do you hedge your deltas back to neutral? The longer you wait, the more you can potentially earn as you capitalize on that gamma move, but you also risk the stock moving in the other direction and not having opportunities to scalp. That's where the tricky part is, and the skill comes in with gamma scalping. Thanks for the question, Joe and Linda. Alan asks, why would I ever buy an option when 90% of them expire worthless? This is a very common question that I get. It's actually a myth in the industry that 90% expire worthless. OCC provides data on an annual basis, and it has consistently shown that of all options opened, about 70 to 75% are closed before ever reaching expiration. 5 to 10% are exercised at some point, and that leaves about 20% that are held through expiration and expire worthless. So it's not 90 or 80 or 70, it's actually 20% held through expiration and worthless. The misunderstanding seems to come from a failure to consider the closing cells. Of all of the options that are held through expiration, a vast majority of those are worthless, which makes sense. If you're an option holder, you like to get something for your option. If there's nothing to get for it, you're going to hold that through expiration, otherwise sell it beforehand. So it is a myth. Most options do not expire worthless. Most of them are closed. So the decision to buy options is therefore more about timing the direction and magnitude of the market, considering time decay and implied volatility, and not so much about most of them expiring worthless. Thanks for the question, Alan. And lastly, from Lesnod, the question is, how do you get out of straddles? One side is always a loss, correct? Well, first of all, when you trade straddles, it's important to realize some form of position management will be necessary. Whether you have bought or sold the straddle, one side will undoubtedly be in the money, which will require a closing transaction in order to avoid a stock position. But it's important to remember that moneyness, that's the in the money status of the option, does not equate to profit or loss. P&L is simply calculated as the difference between the amount paid when buying and the amount received when selling. That's the tricky part, maximizing what you received and minimizing what you paid. It has nothing to do with moneyness. So P&L and moneyness are two separate things. To change your question, you had said one side is always a loss. I would say one side is generally in the money and requires position management. Thanks for the question, Lesnod, and thank you for all of those questions. Keep them coming in, and that's today's Industry Happenings. 
You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have any questions about anything you've heard on today's show, email edmodla at options at the OCC.com or visit www.optionseducation.org and chat with Investor Services. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore edu and Instagram at options education and follow their page on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wide World of Options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.